Hey kids, here is chapter 16 of the Oddmeyer book one, The Changeling. You shouldn't go that way, Fable's voice called down at the boys from high, of them, high above them. We're not listening to you anymore, Tin snapped, continuing his angry trek toward the heart of the forest. Fable hopped from branch to branch, tree to tree. She was keeping up easily, free from the viney undergrowth. You're going to get lost. Lost? Imagine that, Tin glowered and kept moving forward. He was maddest at himself for opening up a total stranger about everything. If you want, we don't need you. We don't want you. Go away. But Fable stopped abruptly as if struck. But we're friends now. Tin let out an exasperated grunt and threw his hands up, stomping off without a response. You should go home, Fable, Cole called up at her a little more gently. We're going to the other side of the Oddmire. It wouldn't be safe for you anyway. We'll find our own way from here. Fable pursed her lips and scowled as Cole hurried to catch up with his brother. For a long while, the boys did not hear another word out of her. From time to time, out of the corner of his eye, Cole caught a flicker of curly hair slipping along the branches above them. He found the sight strangely comforting, in spite of Tin's continued grumbling. Gradually, the trees began to thin, and the air began to thicken. Heavy fog rolled along the spongy earth, and the boys knew that they had found the Oddmire once again. Tin came to a stop right at the edge of the murky swamp, and Cole drew up beside him. I don't see any sort of bridge, said Tin. I don't even see the other side. Can you? Cole said. Tin shook his head. He found a knobby tree branch, almost as tall as he was, and lowered it into the inscrutable green water. It did not touch the bottom. When he tried to pull it out again, the mire sucked at it until eventually he gave up the fight and just let the mire have it. Here and there, tree trunks jutted out in the swamp, their bark coated in moss and slime. It was anyone's guess how far their roots sank below the surface before they found solid earth. Five feet, 50, the trees grew fainter and fainter and farther out they stood, fading into the distance until they were enveloped completely by the thick gray haze. Cole guessed the farthest he could see was 100 feet out, maybe less. Even if the shore was just beyond he clouded his clouded vision, it would still be like swimming through pancake batter to get there. His head spun, just breathing in the heady mist rolling off the Oddmire. Maybe if we could make a raft out of logs, Cole said, <clears throat> although he wasn't sure how well a raft would work on water that was mostly made out of mud, besides which all of the logs were, within eyesight, looked as if they were half mud themselves. There's something out there, said Tim. He pointed out to the murk. Cole tried to follow his gaze. The rolling fog made strange shapes dance in the limits of his vision. Gray ships on gray waves melted into coiled gray dragons, which folded into skeletal gray faces. It's just the mist, Cole murmured. It isn't. There, see it? What is that? Cole blinked hard and looked again. A tiny pinprick of flickering orange light cut through the mist. Is it a lantern? His heartbeat quickened. Maybe there's a house on the other side. No, it's moving. Watch. The tiny light jiggled and jumped, inching forward. Briefly, Cole imagined he had seen a hint of a shadow beside it. An arm? A pair of legs beneath? Someone's crossing, Cole said. If someone was crossing, that meant that there was a way to cross. He and Tin exchanged glances full of excitement and fear. Soon enough, the little flickering light was growing brighter. As it traversed the swamp, it was not bound straight for them, but toward the shore some ways up the bank, and the boys hurried across the soggy ground to reach the spot. Ugh, nothing over this way, Annie Burton grunted. For the dozenth time, the children's trail had tapered off, and she and Cole had been forced to scan the surrounding forest for any sign of them. Nah, this way either, Cole called tromping back toward her, slapping leaves out of his face. Ugh, mind your feet, woman, Cole warned. Annie glanced down, just in time to avoid catching her ankle on a creepy thorny vine. The goblin hissed through his jagged teeth. Tis a bit of the wicked bramble, that is, he said. They're much worse in the deep dark, but them vines run through the wild wood. Nasty things. Oh, stop it, 
They're just vines. Keep looking. I'm going back this way. I saw a building up ahead. Looks like an old rundown cabin. If the boys came this way, maybe they found it too. Wait! Cole drew up to a full stop, his hands out, his eyes wide. What now? Was I about to stump on a pointy pebble? This is a witch in place, he whispered, he whispered the goblin. What? Seriously? Annie glanced around. Cole's ton tone was unsettling, but the real wor world was the real world, and stories were stories. You mean the Witch of the Wood, Queen of the Deep Dark? That's real? Cole pointed to an ancient piece of some bleached, knotted rope halfway up the nearest tree. Which is nuts. He chewed at the bottom lip. We shouldn't be here, he said. Annie let her eyes slide down the trunk. There, near the bottom of the tree, a fresh notch had been cut in the shape of a jagged C. The boys have been here, she said. Come on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cole and Tin were crouched behind a fallen tree when the figure from the fog finally reached the shore of the Admire. He could not have been more than three feet tall, a man or male at least, and very old. This much they surmised from the enormous peppery beard that burst thickly from his face and did not stop until it was dragging on the ground near his toes. The beard was so full and bushy <clears throat> that the man's short, thin body was almost entirely hidden behind it. Like an afterthought, to the facial hair, two scrawny arms stuck out from the sides of the beard, and two dirty bare feet padded along the earth beneath it. But the figure's torso was completely lost to the hairy nest. From out of the top of the bushy nest peeked a wide nose, two squinty eyes, and a very bald head. In the center of the strange man's beard, like a robin's nest tucked into a knot hole of a tree, was the source of the light. A single stout candle shone from within the wiry hair. The beard glowed around the flame, light, light flickering through its curls, but it did not appear to burn. <coughs> Excuse me. Ivory trails of wax trickled below the candle and made themselves a part of the mighty beard. The man faltered as he moved, taking small, hesitant steps toward the forest and casting glances back at the swamp. He had not yet spotted the boys. A bright yellow butterfly flitter, flitted through the trees beside him, and the man froze. His eyes went wide and his nostrils flared. His mustache, wick, mustache hairs wiggled as he panted, watching the little insect flutter across the clearing. Tin and Cole looked at each other in the back of the strange old man. The butterfly was three feet away from him when he suddenly exploded into motion, grasping for the little thing like a cat swiping at a fly. He almost had it once or twice, but the butterfly climbed above his reach up into the forest canopy. The old man cursed under his breath. He leaned his hands on his knees, looking defeated. Cole screwed up his courage and stood up. Um, hi, he said. The little man jumped, made a startling noise that sounded a bit like a donkey sneezing tried to throw himself backward and sideways at the same time and tripped over his own feet and finally spun headlong into a mossy stump. And he sat there, dazed for a moment, looking like an unruly pile of damp hair. It's okay, Cole said, holding out his hands as if he hoped to reassure, in that what he hoped was a reassuring gesture. Tin stepped out to join him. Hey, mister, we're not going to hurt you. We're friendly. We just want to talk to you, added Cole, about the swamp. The man wobbled, gazed up at the twins, and he blinked rapidly, and then looked from one to the other and back again, and he squinted, shook his head, and raised one bushy eyebrow. Slowly, he held up two fingers. Two, said Tin. Yeah, there are two of us. We're twins. Satisfied, the man nodded and let his, the hand drop. I'm Cole, said Cole. This is Tin. What's your name? The man's eyes darted between them. The flame in his chest danced wildly, although neither of the boys could feel the breeze. He did not respond. They don't use names, said a voice above them, and Fable dropped down to the ground right behind the boys with a soft thump. The skittish figure at their feet gave a startled yelp and pressed backward against the stump. And they hardly ever talk either, added Fable, except to each other. They're called hinky punks. Used to be lots of them in the forest, lots of other magical forest folk too. They pretty much all left, though. Even the gnomes left. 
The little man pushed himself up to his full, if unimposing, height and straightened his beard, looking through narrowed eyes at the three children with a slightly accusatory expression on his face, and he held up three fingers. Oh, yeah, there are exactly three, actually three of us, I guess, said Tim behind him. Fable did not try to hide her smile. That's one's, that one's called Fable. She's annoying, but we're not going to hurt you either. But she's not going to hurt you either. So what do we call you? The man pursed his lips, furrowing his brow as he scratched behind his ear. Hinky punks just are what they are, Fable said. They haven't got names. They must have called each other something, said Cole, back when there were more of them. Come to think of it, where did they go? Asked Fable or said Fable, leaning in toward the old man. All the other hinky punks and spriggans and pixies and stuff, do you know where they went? Mama said you all had to leave, but she didn't say why. And how come you didn't go with them? The hinky punk's candle dimmed and flickered. He glanced at Fable and his shoulders sagged. You didn't want them to go without you, did you, said Tin. And now they're all gone. The old man just stared at the ground and heaved a sigh. His brow cast a heavy shadow over his eyes. Look, um, we need to get to the other side of the Oddmire, Cole said. The man's eyes flickered to the swamp. We saw you crossing. Do you think you could show us the way? The hinky punk's eyes widened for a moment, and he looked as if he would like to climb right out of his own hair and run away. I like your beard, said Fable, and your candle. I'm going to call you Candlebeard, okay? The hinky punk raised his head a fraction, and he shrugged. Will you take us to the other side? Fable asked. Candlebeard glanced at the swamp, and he swallowed. I'm really sorry about your family, said Tin softly. I wish we could help you. Candlebeard nodded glumly. But if you helped us, it might just well, it might just help all the magical creatures left in the wildwood. It would definitely help my family. You see, it's really important that we get to the other side of the Oddmire. It would mean an awful lot if you would show us the way. Candlebeard pursed his lips. Very gradually, he raised his hand. It trembled just a little. He was holding up four fingers. Yeah, said Tim, the four of us. And that's the end of chapter 16. And that's what the beginning of chapter 17 looks like. Oh my gosh.